Hello, welcome to the Tolkien Collector's Guide YouTube channel, where we gather experts from around the world to discuss Tolkien's books and the people who read them. I'm Guru Loke, and with me are Trotter and Mr. Underhill. Welcome to uh, the, the Tolkien Collector's Guide. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, it's a very interesting, from my point of view, um, a book to talk about because it's one that a uh, a lot of people uh, aren't really that familiar with, um, and one of the things that if you actually look at Tolkien and say, well, if he hadn't written in the the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, the Silmarillion, what would he be known for? Well, we wouldn't be doing this thing today, uh, I think, if he hadn't done that. But he would definitely still be known for Sir Gawain the Green Knight. It's there'd be a lot of, less to collect. Yeah, there'd be, well, there'd be that and probably Beowulf <laughs> yeah. and Monsters and the Critics, and that's it. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, Beowulf, I, I think that that's a subject that we will hopefully cover as well at some point in the future. Yeah, but Sir Gawain well, Andrew, the Green you could Knight... Still collect, you could still collect goblin feet, so... Uh, it's goblin feet, yes, I could collect goblin feet. Uh, we're not going to do an episode of goblin feet, though. No, we're not. Uh, not right now. <laughs> so, so, Sir Gawain the Green Knight, um, this was in 1925, it was first published, and uh, Tolkien actually did this with his friend and the person who got him a job at Leeds University, uh, E.V. Gordon. Um... They, um, Sir Gawain is, is actually an interesting um, subject. It's a Middle English uh, poem. It's an Arthurian. Um, and it actually comes from the West Midlands. Now, most Middle English uh, uh, items from that period are really from the London area in the southeast of England because they're the only ones that, that managed to be kept. Uh, so, for instance, the most famous Middle English stories, of course, are Chaucer. Um, and he was very good at sort of going into London and um, publicising the work, whereas Sir Gawain would only really have been known about as an oral story, probably around the sort of Birmingham, West Midlands area of the UK. And we're very fortunate that it actually ended up, the manuscript was kept, Um but it wasn't found, I think, until the 19th century. It was it was lost somewhere, and it, it was then picked up and found. Um, the translation of it, um, the, 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 the translation that people use today, if they actually, say, want to know uh, what, the, what the, the Middle English means in modern English, is probably going to be Tolkien's translation. Uh, and he largely did the translation. Uh, E.B. Gordon did the, the notes. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, episode, which we'll put in the, the link, uh, of a BBC radio programme called In Our Time on Sir Gawain the Green Knight. And uh, it goes through a, a lot of this stuff about about the actual story. Uh, Tolkien is mentioned in there. Evie Gordon's not, which is a bit of a shame, but, um, but Tolkien is, is mentioned. Um, the book came out, obviously, in uh, 1925. Um it was two and a half thousand copies. There are various different states of the book, uh, which I assume uh, occurred uh, as it was being printed. Um, some some things were changed. Um, uh, that some of them actually even have adverts in the book, and some don't. Um, but it's been reprinted quite a lot because it was such a sort of iconic work. It, it was reprinted again, I think, in the nineteen thirties, nineteen forties. Um, then um, was it Neil somebody Davis what was his name I can't remember um, he there was actually a revision done um, by oh yeah in the the mid 60s uh, Norman Davis sorry yeah Norman Davis Norman revised Davis, yeah. it uh, and he was actually given the notes he was actually allowed given access to Tolkien's notes so Tolkien said you can have a look at my original notes for the translation to use uh, for this which is good uh, again, I'm not really sure what the revisions are in there, but it does sound like it was quite extensively uh, revised because uh, th this one actually is a second edition of, uh, of the book. Um, it was then also um, Christopher Tolkien's first book really that he edited of his father's 
was Sir Gawain the Green Knight, along with Pearl and Sir Orfeo. And that was in 1975. Um, that... Um, that book is still sort of in print uh, today. A, a, a deluxe version came out recently. And a paperback, um, a UK paperback, came out with a very nice uh, illustration on it. And it's actually one, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the nicest uh, copies. If no one, if you don't actually have a copy of Sigwain the Green Knight, uh, I'm actually going to recommend in this case that you get the paperback that's out at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because I just like, just because I like the cover. Of it. I, I'm not sure who the artist was for that, but I think it's a fantastic uh, piece of artwork. So that really, in, in a nutshell, that, that that's a Gawain. Now, um, I know that some people actually try and collect all the different uh, versions of, of this, and you know, I think it is actually is quite a challenge to uh, to get all of these things. Uh, what 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 do you two think about uh, about Sir Gawain, the experience with it? Well, I'm one of the I'm one of those collectors that is not like uh, it's not a pressing issue for me, but I would eventually like to have uh, each one of the each one of the prints of Sir Gawain, especially those early versions of the book. Um, I'm a big fan, just in general, of uh, those uh, those early Oxford books. Like I, I just really like the the jackets that all those early Oxford books have. Just the minimalism of the jacket. You know, it's got maybe one sort of small device on there, and it's got some text. Uh, I, I'm just a big fan of those of, of those early jackets. So I have I currently have a a, a 25 um, without the jacket. Like it's it it's a real beat up copy. Um, I've got a 30. I've got a, a two from the 40s. I've got two from the 50s. I've got a I've got a 1960. Um, there I don't have any of the second edition. I, I know uh, I think Andrew mentioned earlier. Uh, off camera that he's got a, a paperback of the second edition. So that fun. green one, but I, I, there's, there's a hardback that I would like to get as well. Um, but yeah, eventually I, I would like to have uh, uh, each one of those, uh, one of those prints because the book itself too is very, it's quite, uh, it's quite nice to look at. It's green. Uh, it's got uh, a lot of them have the Oxford device on the spine, which is really cool. Um, the mm -hmm. <laughs> For those of you out there who know the, um, the, the, the early, editions of Sir Gawain, the early prints from the 20s and the 30s are bigger, and then they get smaller as you go along. <laughs> um, the book shrinks in the 40s and the 50s. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I really do enjoy um, those early prints. Um, and I do recommend the, the, the Christopher Tolkien edited one too from the 70s. It's, it's very nice to, to have as well. The dust jacket is great. It's green. It's got a nice green color. Um, the book itself, the paper quality is really good. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just like Andrew, I'm a really big fan of all of the, the different versions of the Tolkien Sir Gawain, uh, story. There was those corrections made in the 1930 printing, weren't there? I seem to remember. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, but that's yeah, not it's it's revised every time. Yeah. If you yeah. look on the copyright page of the 30, it's, it says second revised edition in 1930, okay. I think pretty sure I'll have to look, but it does say revised for 1930. Yeah. So there were so, corrections. So there, and then there's the 66, which is another revision, major revision. I think there were minor corrections made in various uh, impressions throughout the years, but um, th there were major changes in the 66 and then in the 70s one that Christopher did, correct? So there's kind of four editions of the text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Gawain was actually on the radio as well, I think, at some point. There was actually a radio broadcast of it, which Tolkien... And I think it might have been Tolkien who actually uh, was in did the broadcast. And um, like Andrew said earlier, the, <laughs> the Christopher Tolkien edition is really good to have too because you get you get Pearl and you get Sir Orfeo, which uh, Pearl on its own Pearl is a fantastic poem. If you if yes. those of you who are not familiar with with Pearl, uh, you, you I don't know if you'll make that make th make it through without getting kind of emotional. It's so well <laughs> done and so well written. It's a very very nice poem. Yeah, and Pearl was also not read by Tolkien, but it was performed on the BBC a regional station in 1936. Uh, I don't know that it was his translation of it. I think it was. I'm trying to get those notes. Uh... 
it might have been his translation, but when, I don't. His translation, I don't think, had been published. No, it hadn't. So he, he, but he may have given it to them. Yep. He when might did, have given that to the BBC. When, to when Tolkien translated Sir Gawain, was that? Did he translate Pearl and Sir Ophio around the same time, or did he do that later? I, I'm, my ti- my timeline's fuzzy as to when he did what. Uh, I think he just did Sir Gawain to begin with because there was enough yeah. there was enough work in there just yeah. for that just for that one to be uh, to be translated. Mm-hmm. Um, and he uh, and obviously he needed somebody else to help him uh, with 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 the notes, mm-hmm. uh, but it is pretty much the, the case that uh, that he did all the translation himself. So really, when you are reading that, that is his translation. Well, now that I'm thinking, of, the, I, I, now that I'm thinking about it, the the I I do have uh, Evie Gordon's edition of Pearl somewhere. Um, the uh, Yes, there is a version of Pearl. There, that some yeah, did, isn't yeah. Evie Gordon did a lot of work on Pearl, but I know Tolkien helped him with that, or he, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, I know that they had a long, uh, long working relationship to, over you know many uh, many years. And Sir, Sir Orphia, that was the one that that Tolkien taught in the war to uh, to REF uh, candidates. He actually. Uh, that they and uh, Rainer Unwin was one of the people who narrowly missed going because he joined the REF. I think uh, slightly after that had happened, and it, Tolkien had stopped by the time he got to Oxford. He just missed out and got, been on that course, which has been quite interesting. Well, Andrew, I know you don't have a you, you may not have a first print of Sir Gawain, but I know you have something even more rare. Uh, yes, I, I do have a, a proof copy of, uh, of which is green, the green which Knight. is not green for some reason. It's not green. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it, it was my the proof copy is took away in the brown night, and, uh, <laughs> and they and they covered it and they coloured it in brown just because he's a brown knight. You know, uh, it's actually, um, I I've got to imagine that uh, they sent the, the the cover over to uh, to Rain Runwin and uh, and to Christopher and Christopher. They both probably said, "Well, the cover really should probably be green." It's a bit of a clue there in the uh, in the name. The fact it says Green Knight on the cover, it should really be green. And they did change it to that. Um, there's some other. Uh, there's a few other changes. Um, yeah, in in the book, but on the whole, the, the proof copy is very similar to the, apart from the cover, and it's absolutely fascinating to see that it's a completely different uh, color to the uh, to the released version. Well, the other thing too, I think that we're that we that we should mention too is that Sir Gawain is just a good story. It's 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 an interesting, it compelling story, uh, and I think that's sort of, I think. It res- it must resonate with a lot of people because there's been several adaptations of Sir Gawain over the years. There's there was just recently an adaptation which I thought was pretty good. I mean, it wasn't super strict to the text, but it was it, it was Sir Gawain inspired. But it was I I, I mean I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed I the like spirit. The one with Sean Connery. Yeah. I like the Sean Connery <laughs> one in it. I mean, that, that's quite because he, he's also actually he's the one. Green Knight. Yeah, he's the Green Knight, isn't yeah, he? I think he is Connery. the Green Knight. Yeah, yeah, he's the Green Knight. Yeah, so yeah, that's very good. I like that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, the, the the clever bit about it, which I haven't really got into, but the, the whole thing about his head coming off, you know, is you're meant to know at the time these things. So when you're looking at it, the the the, the knight goes in in, in to, to see the people to, to into Arthur's court. The idea is that the, the knight says, "You can chop my head off." And people at that time used to do this thing at uh, at Christmas where they used to sort of tap each other. So they tap each other, and that was like using a sword and chopping someone's head off. So the people listening to this and watching would know what what it was meant to happen. Not so Gawain gets up and chops his head off with a sword. That isn't what's meant to happen at all. And of course, and then then it, it all go. It, it's all based around misunderstandings. The whole story mm-hmm. uh, of what uh, of what various. It's a very it's a very clever story and it's definitely worth uh reading uh Tolkien's translation is very good and there are some very good adaptions of it yeah so heart, i definitely recommend Sigway and the green knight to people particularly if you've never read it or even were aware of it before yeah i think it's good to note for the uh for the early editions uh to keep an eye out for the dust jacket uh, they're they're yeah. very difficult to find. Most of these books were used by academics and students, and dust jackets were not preserved uh, for the most part. So 
it's it's very scarce to find in a good quality dust jacket so that's definitely something to keep an eye out for uh, there's certainly collectability in the book itself without the dust jacket but uh, that, that's a small feature to keep an eye out for uh, we've mentioned sort of our favorite additions coming through here i think the text has improved uh, with age like i reading the most recent paperback is is an excellent place to start if you want the story uh, itself uh, and then yeah there's there's a lot of impressions out there. We'll, we'll put some show notes uh, in, in this episode to point you to uh, some of the guides for, for the different editions and what to look for in them, but uh, uh, they're, all, they're all good. <laughs> <laughs>